Good afternoon from Geneva. Thank you for joining this Resetting Geopolitics Leadership Panel. The Davos Agenda has been a week of action-oriented dialogue on key priorities, building crisis-resilient health systems, shaping inclusive economies, accelerating climate action. But the single ingredient required for achieving all these ambitions is greater multilateral and multi-stakeholder cooperation. But cooperation hasn't always been easy to come by, as we all know. Indeed, uh, we have seen uh, the consequences of uh, fractured responses to COVID-19 pandemic, over 2 million lives lost, and a global economy that have contracted 3.5%. Unless we take corrective action, we risk an incomplete and uneven recovery and less resilience in the face of the next challenge. This is why I can think of no better panel to explore how we rebuild and re uh, revitalize global partnerships. The leaders here today have shown what greater cooperation can look like, whatever that is between business, government, and at the regional level or globally. So uh, I'm very pleased uh, to have with us uh, Arantxa Gonzalez, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, European Union and Cooperation of Spain, welcome. François-Philippe Champagne, the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry of Canada. He used to be the Minister of Foreign Affairs just recently. And Ernesto Araujo, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Brazil. So this is uh, a super great panel. And uh, Minister uh, González Arancha, you have at an early uh, phase of uh, this pandemic said, this is the time to come together and collaborate. Um, I think you got a lot of support on that, but recently we have seen more competition and lately we've even seen some vaccination nationalism out there. So were you too optimistic or do you see also uh, light in the end of the tunnel on cooperation? Well, to the um, um, first, uh, before we start, uh, Borg, thank you very much for this invitation and thank you for the, to the World Economic Forum for um, obliging us to take a little bit of time and think um, in order to act a little bit better. You provided us this opportunity at the beginning of the crisis. And yes, I said that um, I thought cooperation was the way. And frankly, to cooperation skeptics, um, I think uh, this pandemic uh, has proven that cooperation is the most promising avenue, the most effective one. We wouldn't have been able to develop a vaccine in less than a year if it hadn't been for international cooperation, by the way, public and private. We wouldn't have been able uh, to ensure liquidity trickles down uh, to the smallest economies if it hadn't been by pulling financial resources through international cooperation. Certainly, this is the lesson we've learned in Europe. And we wouldn't be able to uh, sequence uh, the different uh, COVID strains if it is not through pooling data. So cooperation is proving the most efficient way to deal with the pandemic and its impact. Um, I want to um, uh, take the question that you put uh, to me, which is the one on vaccines. I think, uh, as I said, we wouldn't have been able to develop this vaccine were it not for a huge public-private effort. The brains of our scientists, the power of pharmaceutical companies, and the public financing of governments that have been injected in incredible amounts uh, to ensure we develop this together. And now we need to make sure that everyone has equitable access to the vaccine. This is why uh, Spain has just uh, uh, last week uh, released uh, our own plan for solidarity uh, for COVID vaccines. It's our vision. Uh, we will not be safe. None of us will be until all of us are. And this is why we need equitable access uh, to vaccine. And this is why um, vaccines nationalism is not good. But it's, it's also not going to help us uh, that pharmaceutical companies, or let me say some pharmaceutical companies, uh, don't uh, meet 
the contracts that they've signed uh, with government. So I think what we need to do uh, in the next months is continue with this spirit of public-private partnership with uh, governments, continue to uh, inject resources with private companies, uh, like so many of them, uh, private pharmaceutical companies, uh, continue to ensure the um, vaccines uh, reach uh, those who have purchased them, uh, meeting their obligations, and all of us working together, public and private, to ensure vaccines reach everyone, including poorer countries, uh, and making sure that we do this uh, through an internationally agreed mechanism, which is COVAX, uh, in the uh, uh, in the World Health Organization. So that's Borge, uh, no fan of nationalism, but also no fan of uh, companies not meeting their obligations, and a big fan of public and private to ensure vaccines reach each and every citizen around the world. No, thank you so much. Many important things to follow up on there. Just uh, one um, point related to what we mobilized in less than a year uh, with all these vaccines. Usually it takes, as you said, eight to ten years uh, to see these uh, results. So I think this shows also that the private sector can really, really uh, support. But I think, as you said, you're also a bit disappointed now uh, with uh, the delivery not coming. Uh, how serious do you think this situation is and what, what measures do government really have when uh, you see these uh, critical delays? Well, I think some delays are, uh, let's say, unavoidable. We've had little hiccups here and there. Pfizer has had them. Um, um, Moderna has had them. But there's been a real disposition on the part of the company uh, to explain, to be transparent, and to help in all of us, including uh, citizens, understand uh, the specific of their challenges, which is basically scaling up in a massive way to deliver vaccines to every citizen as soon as possible. Uh, but I think we need to see this behavior in all pharmaceutical companies. This is a very important moment, uh, again, for governments, but also for the private sector, and in particular, this important sector of our economy uh, that is indispensable to the fight uh, for the fight against COVID, which is pharmaceutical companies. Uh, some have a bit of uh, work to do in ensuring greater transparency and in meeting the requirements of the contracts they have signed. Uh, we have to be uh, very transparent about that. It's part of building confidence. And in doing all of this, uh, being mindful that uh, the purpose of all of this, of this public-private endeavor, is to ensure equitable access to the vaccine, not just uh, for Europeans or Americans or Chinese or Russians or Canadians or Brazilians, for every citizen in every country of this world. That's the challenge we face. And so we need good behavior on the side of governments. We need good behavior on the side of pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we in Spain are working very closely with the European Commission, who's been the spokesperson for Europe uh, on negotiating access to vaccines and ensuring equitable access uh, for every European citizen to make sure uh, every uh, company with whom uh, they have, uh, the commission has negotiated an agreement uh, meets the terms of the contract. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, uh, François-Philippe Champagne. Uh, just um, uh, on the vaccination, it would be very interesting also how uh, Canada's uh, strategy uh, is on this. And also one point that uh, was um, uh, mentioned by Minister uh, Arantxa uh, González is that if we don't fight uh, COVID everywhere, uh, you will then develop possibly new strains and variants in those countries that are not vaccinated. And then the virus can mutate and then it hits you back big time. And uh, either vaccines uh, are not 100% working or you have to go into a situation where you have to vaccinate people uh, every fall like you do with the flu. So there are many, many uh, kind of uh, challenges there. I, I don't think we're yet out of the woods. I don't know how you look at it. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Borg, and thank you to the World Economic Forum for fostering discussion and, and, and understanding. I mean, you've been doing that for decades, and, and I could not think of a better time to come together. And I would say, um, I would subscribe to what Arantxa said. You know, from the get-go, we all realize that the vaccine needs to be a public good. We realize that cooperation 
it is the only way forward. Um, I, and I think to your point, I would say we're in the second wave. And we already uh, need, I would say, some insurance policy for the new variants. It's not only about the vaccine that we need now, obviously, but we need to look ahead to, to be better prepared. I think if there's one lessons learned uh, from that is that the world is both fragile and resilient. And, and I think that uh, we have demonstrated collectively that no challenge is too big when we work together. And, and therefore, I think we need to do that. Um, if I think about uh, what's coming up and, and the opportunities, uh, I think to, to, to some of the questions that were raised, um, countries are going to develop new industrial policies. I can see, and I'm happy to, to come in more detail, uh, opportunities around supply chain, opportunity around the digital economy, and also opportunities around science diplomacy. I think that uh, we have learned that uh, uh, we get better outcome uh, when we follow the science and whether it's, it's uh, you know, technology, uh, innovation. And I think that this is one area, uh, I would think, Borgay, where if there is one lesson learned for this world is that the best way to tackle some of the big challenges, today it's a health challenge, but I think we can all agree that the, the next big one or the one which is even bigger, which is now is climate change. And I think to colleagues around the world, what we've been uh, what we're going to be looking at is kind of science diplomacy. How can, as uh, my dear friend Arantxa said, how can we pull together science, technology, innovation to tackle the big challenges in front of us? Would your new portfolio uh, business and economy, you know, Canada is a G7 uh, economy. You're one of the, the big ones in this field. You saw the IMF report that came out on Tuesday this week. Um, the global growth looks a bit better uh, this year than we expected. I guess that's also uh, based on the fact that uh, there is vaccination uh, going on. Uh, global governments have launched 12 trillion US dollars in stimulus and more is on its way. We're doing whatever it takes. But I guess that uh, there will be a situation also down the road where you cannot continue to increase that and you have to also rely then on uh, uh, the growth uh, taking on its uh, own uh, way of, of growth. And there may be also private sector will have to play a uh, more important role because uh, the fiscal muscles of governments are limited and we can also then mobilize uh, private sector. Maybe you can say something about that and also related to uh, the situation, uh, situation now uh, in Canada. Well, uh, I fully agree with you. I mean, speaking with some economists, uh, some of them see the rate of vaccination as a proxy for growth. I think everyone understand that uh, we need to save lives and livelihoods and, and certainly vaccination is the key component to that to, to, to get to an economic recovery. And, and to your point, and I wanted to touch on the private sector. I mean, I think all of us in government would say uh, government can do big things. I think we have demonstrated that government matters, particularly in this uh, uh, pandemic. But I would say government can do things I can do big things, but the partnership, and Arantxa mentioned that, between the public and private sector has allowed us to do big things fast. And that, I think, to me, is a big learning in terms of the only way to tackle these big challenges is to work together. I mean, if you look around the world, whether it's personal protective equipment, whether it's about vaccines, whether it's about ventilators, you saw a firm innovate, uh, you saw a firm retool, re-engineer, uh, to, to meet the challenge. And for me, that's inspiring because if you're thinking about jobs and growth, I think there's two trends. There's uh, uh, decarbonization and digitalization. That's why in my previous uh, intervention, I talk about uh, almost the digital economy or let's say the e-economy. I think many have said it's the e-everything today. And I think that when you want to tackle some of the uh, challenges you just said, Borge, I think growth and jobs is key to that. Um, first, we need to make sure that we protect, we vaccinate our population, but at the same time, we already need to take actions for a long-term vision, which I think, um, you know, I think supply chains will be redefined. I think we're going to go from global to regional. Many have said that people will put more emphasis on resilience as opposed to efficiency, um, stability, predictability, security of supplies. Uh, for me, I think, uh, 
I've heard that time and time again. Uh, when it comes to the digital economy, I mean, you've said it, I think the web, I think it's something like 52% of the world population, which is connected, 1.5 billion uh, smartphones. I mean, clearly the world is going in that direction. So how can we use uh, uh, somehow uh, the opportunity we have now to make sure that we reskill, we retool for that economy? And, and again, um, I think all of that is going to lead to new industrial policies, which are going to bring new alliances. I really believe in the power of, alli uh, of alliances. We've seen it during the COVID uh, pandemic. Countries come together. I think when it comes to industrial policy, uh, we'll have to do that. Put citizens first, their needs first, and certainly uh, we'll want to work with colleagues around the world. Just uh, a short uh, question because before we go to Ernesto Arroyo. Um, you know, uh, since last time we met, we had had uh, elections uh, in the U.S. and also a uh, new president. We know uh, that uh, the situation between the G2, uh, the U.S. and uh, China uh, is uh, quite uh, difficult. Uh, Canada is a big trading partner um, with uh, the U.S. How worried are you that this geopolitical uh, tension and this decoupling, uh, the two systems can have negative uh, impact on future uh, growth. And uh, I think you as foreign minister, you had, uh, uh, you had uh, dialogue with, with China on your particular um, uh, challenges, but you also had uh, challenges um, with the former administration. So now you can share with us very freely, you know, reflections on this. I like the way you put it very freely. Um, uh, listen, clearly, I think uh, I've said it before, uh, the election of, of uh, President Biden and the new administration, I think it's good news. I think from our perspective, as you know, we, we have so much of integrated supply chain. I mean, we exchange $2 billion a day in terms of trade and, and two thirds of the states of the United States, Canada is their first uh, market. Actually, the, the US sells more to Canada than China, Japan and the UK combined. So sometimes I say we've been blessed by geography and our destiny uh, is somewhat joined that a decision on one side of the border will have an impact on both. But I think uh, it offers opportunities, not only for Canada. And let me say, I think, for example, uh, on the fight uh, for COVID, I think there's more opportunities to, to share. And I saw um, uh, you had Dr. Fauci on, on some of your panel. I hope we can in the science diplomacy do more together. I think also in the economic recovery, uh, there's a sense that uh, hopefully uh, we can work more together. And I think these supply chain will be key as we retool them for the world. And on the decoupling, and you mentioned technology, I think we'll have to, 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 uh, to reflect on that. And I'm thinking of colleagues who are here and those who join us. Uh, there's certainly a competition. There's a race for standards. There's a race for rules and regulation. And, and I think we, it's incumbent upon us, I would say, uh, the democracies of the world to come together also about a governance to make sure that technology is at the service of people. And I think that this is the type of things uh, we can work together. And the fact that he has appointed uh, Senator Kerry to be the uh, climate change czar, I think it, this is good news for all of us because now we have someone in the White House. It's a very strong message to the world that uh, the U.S. wants to be uh, an active player. And I think that opens up the whole clean tech market and, and that could really transform, um, I would say, economies and, and bring us to a world which is, uh, you know, going to net zero. And I think anything we can do to accelerate uh, on that front would be a good thing. Thank you so much, uh, François Philippe. Uh, now to Ernesto Arroyo, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Brazil. Uh, Brazil is in a very important uh, BRICS uh, country. Uh, you're also a giant uh, in your part uh, of the world. And uh, I think your relationship with uh, the U.S. is, of course, important, but also your relationship with China. I think you said, Minister, um, recently that it's important of a greater mutual understanding between uh, Brazil uh, and the U.S. Over to you. That's right. Thank you, Berger. Yes, uh, any change in the United States is immensely important for us, immensely important for the whole world. Uh, basically, um, what I think is that we need the United States uh, to remain the superpower of freedom. We need uh, the United States to keep playing that role that they have been playing for 100 years or more. 
uh, around the world, right? So um, if uh, the, the new administration wants to focus so much on, on climate change, we think that's great. Brazil is also focusing on climate change. But um, what we think is the, the core and should be the core and we want to be the core of our relationship is the uh, fundamental concept of freedom and, and liberty. So um, that's where we want to build our, our partnership with the United States uh, uh, on. And uh, for that, you need, of course, mutual understanding in the sense of also Brazil being perceived as what we are, what Brazil stands for today, which is democracy, uh, an open economy. Uh, we come from uh, decades where uh, Brazil had a semi-state-run uh, uh, economy with lots of corruption, uh, and we are trying to overcome that, and we need key partners, not only the United States, but the U.S. is a key partner, but also uh, the, the countries of uh, my friends here represented, uh, Canada, Spain, the European Union. Uh, we need those key partners to rebuild Brazil as a modern economy uh, and really as a force for democracy in the region and in the world. So with the United States in particular, it's a key relationship to uh, promote democracy uh, in the hemisphere, in the Western hemisphere. Um, tremendous challenges are there for democracy, against democracy now, especially the connection between organized crime and certain political currents uh, in the region. We have to face that head on uh, with the United States and all other uh, partners uh, that uh, have been standing for democracy in the region. And uh, around the world, we also see uh, challenges to, um, to democracy. Uh, in that case, uh, what we see as a challenge is the emergence of some sort of, uh, maybe it's, a, it's too much to say that, but I will use the, the expression, a techno-totalitarianism, which is uh, this way of, uh, and it's not a question of US against China or China against US, it's a question of different models of society that are emerging with the, um, the new technologies. And new technologies can be great for democracy, but they can also provide the means for total control societies, and we don't want those. And uh, big tech companies can work for freedom, but they also can be instruments for totalitarian control. And that's the challenge that we would like to address uh, together with the uh, US and uh, all other democratic uh, partners. Um, the panel uh, is about uh, resetting geopolitics, and I, I have been saying that we also need to think uh, to think about logo politics, logo in the sense of discourse. Uh, whoever controls uh, the discourse today, public discourse, has tremendous power, and uh, we cannot leave that uh, in uh, the hands of uh, actors. And I'm not talking about countries and or uh, specific countries or specific um, or specific companies, but actors that are not committed to uh, uh, to freedom. Right. So. Um, that's where uh, I see uh, this new connection that we want to, to build with the United States under the Biden administration, uh, but also, as I said, that we uh, want to build with uh, all partners, uh, preserving uh, economic efficiency, preserving uh, the, the need for uh, sustainable uh, development for a quick recovery, but without forgetting uh, freedom. You, you know, Berger, uh, uh, I'm not a great uh, fan of the concept of, uh, of the Great Reset, and why is that? Uh, it's not, we don't have anything against what's in it, uh, but uh, which is sustainable de development, uh, equality, uh, uh, um, everything. But uh, the, uh, the question of, not, uh, of what, what's not there, and that's basically uh, the concept of freedom and, and democracy. So um, that's the, um, the, the key frame, I think, of where we see uh, the role today. We want economic efficiency, sustainable development inside a framework uh, of freedom and, and democracy, and we have to work uh, worldwide for uh, for that goal. No, thank you so much, Minister, for also underlining uh, this with uh, freedom and, and liberty. One of the things that um, uh, President Biden said in the election campaign was that he wanted, as president, to initiate uh, a meeting in D.C. and an alliance of democracies. Uh, do you, uh, are you supportive of uh, such approach? And uh, would Brazil uh, also then uh, join, I guess? Uh, and how do you see this dilemma then between such an alliance and also, for example, your cooperation um, with, uh, with the BRICS, where, where you play a major role? Yes. Yes, we are, in principle, we're in favor of the idea of uh, an alliance of democracies. Um, uh, it seems that it's a project that has everything to do with uh, what Brazil stands for today, 
uh, as I said, and uh, what we would like to uh, to achieve. Uh, so uh, it's uh, I think it should not be seen as something uh, against uh, specific uh, actors, but uh, for democracy. So an alliance of democracies for uh, for the, uh, democracy. And uh, in a way, we have been already uh, working in things that I think have to do with. Uh, with that sort of, um, of alliance. For example, in the WTO, uh, Brazil stands uh, strongly for a process of reform of the WTO that uh, brings the WTO back to its original calling of uh, uh, or working with the principles of, uh, of the market economy, for example. Uh, sometimes today you see in the world, uh, if you play by the rules and if you open your economy like Brazil is opening, you're punished. And if you uh, keep subsidies and if you don't Sometimes play by the rules, you you are uh, rewarded, and we should we should um, avoid that and, and change that. We need an international system that uh, rewards democracy, right? Uh, not that it punishes anyone, but that re rewards democracy, reward, re rewards uh, countries that uh, open up and that uh, want to have a, a, I mean a freedom, uh, fundamental uh, fundamental freedoms, uh, freedom of speech, uh, everything, and also. Uh, uh, economic freedom as well. So um, uh, the uh, the idea of an alliance of democracies, uh, I think, it's great. Uh, conceived not as a as an alliance against something, but an alliance for something, for this uh, deeper concept of uh, of democracy. And uh, as I told you, Brazil is coming uh, f from uh, a situation where we were getting a, more and more away from uh, the uh, the democratic world. Uh, in previous administrations in Brazil, uh, away from uh, market economy. And there's strong, uh, not only political, but popular and uh, social sentiment that Brazil must become a force uh, for uh, freedom, for liberty, for uh, market economies as well. So uh, we see ourselves as a player uh, in that sort of uh, alliance. We, we have uh, also uh, two other experts on, on trade here um, with us, with Arantxa, but also um, uh, François Philippe. Uh, Arantxa, uh, how important do you think uh, trade will be uh, in the global recovery in the post-COVID world? How much of a change do you think it will be you now uh, on uh, the trade policies with the new Biden administration? Do you think it will be as much as you saw the first day when he re-entered uh, the Paris Agreement? Or is that uh, much more uh, nuanced? And w w where will WTO uh, be uh, in a year's time? Well, uh, the first thing I would say is that uh, trade will play an important role in the recovery, like it did in the recovery of the post-2009 uh, crisis. And this is why it is important to continue to work for open markets, but also for fair trade rules. Uh, it's not enough to open. You also need to make sure that everybody is going to play by the rules. And we need to ensure that those rules are uh, attuned uh, to the realities of international trade uh, today. One uh, of the big game changers in international trade has been the fast rise of digital trade. And we have seen this in a very marked manner during uh, this last year uh, when we were confined in our homes. Uh, there were enormous restrictions to mobility, but uh, online shopping uh, skyrocketed. This online shopping is to a large extent, digital international trade. So what we need uh, first is obviously to keep in mind that open markets work better uh, for, uh, will work better for their recovery. They work better for efficiency, uh, for competitiveness, for innovation, and therefore for growth and jobs. But uh, we have uh, to do a lot of work on the side of updating the rules of international trade, especially in this space of uh, digital trade. And this is where uh, the World Trade Organization is such an important global institution. It's the place uh, where we can most effectively uh, update the rules of international trade. This is why I hope uh, that uh, the new U.S. administration uh, working together with uh, many other WTO members, uh, many are included in this panel, 
Uh, but there are many more out there, uh, including China, come work uh, to find uh, the rules that uh, will ensure fair uh, rules of the game uh, in this new digital space. And this will be tricky because there are lots of issues there from uh, data to localization issues to privacy issues uh, to safety and security to cyber security, all of which is extremely sensitive all of which is at the heart of a lot of the geopolitical games uh, uh, that uh, we see on display in our world. Uh, so it will be difficult. But I think we could start, uh, for example, in international trade by unblocking the leadership of the World Trade Organization. Make sure that at least the organization has a leader that can help in updating the rules of the game. And I really do hope that uh, the new U.S. administration um, I hope that it, it does look at uh, at this leadership uh, issue and, and and get on with it. Thank you. I, I just wanted to come uh, shortly back to this uh, notion of uh, two systems and uh, decoupling. Um, if you have one Chinese system and you have one uh, U.S.-led system, and um, how uh, serious would that be for also future economic growth? Uh, for the world. Is there a way of two big economies, the two largest in the world, competing but at the same time defining uh, some common ground and then having some areas where they might decouple and have uh, different systems? And how do the EU as the largest market in the world then deal with this? Can the EU end up like uh, between a rock and a hard place or how does EU deal with this? Uh, Competition, because I guess the, one of the few um, bipartisan uh, things in DC these days are like uh, the view on China. I think you're absolutely right, Borge, that uh, the big geopolitical issue of our time is the rise of China, the competition that it poses to the US, and the spillover effects that it has on the rest of the world. And what I would say is that I see three three things that we need to keep in mind, especially if you are the rest of the world. And certainly Spain, the European Union is the rest of the world uh, for this, uh, for the purposes of this discussion. First, there are issues uh, where decoupling just simply does not work. We cannot decouple climate change. So if we want to deal with climate change, we need to make sure we delimit and de delineate the space for cooperation, including between China and the US and the rest of the world in this systemic issue called climate change. Otherwise, it just simply will not work. Then there is another space where we are going to see competition. And what we need to uh, determine there is very clear rules of the game for this competition, whether it's on international trade, whether it's on technology, whether it's on investments. And there we need to be clear also that the rules have to be clear and the rules have to be fair. Otherwise, uh, it just it's going to lead to a decoupling. And then there is a third uh, consideration we need to keep in mind, which is avoid at all cost open confrontation. Uh, because it's open confrontation will just simply uh, uh, ensure that, uh, you know, distraction of every player, whether you are the US or China or the rest of the world. So we need, th these are for me the three considerations we need to keep in mind. Uh, there is areas where decoupling simply doesn't work. There are areas where we need rules of the game. And above all, we need to avoid open confrontation. No, this is um, a very, very important um, observations. And as I'm looking at you, uh, um, Arantxa is, is uh, I guess, both uh, even big countries like Brazil and, and Canada are the rest of the world in this uh, context. So how, how do you look at it? Yes. So uh, first of all, um, if you look a little bit back uh, to the 90s, early 2000s, uh, when China became a big partner and player in globalization and was brought into the uh, uh, multilateral trading system. The idea was that uh, China would become more and more like the West, right? And uh, this didn't happen, of course. Uh, what, uh, but also uh, from a certain point, what started to happen is uh, that the West uh, started to become more and more like China. And uh, I think we shouldn't uh, look at, at any of those uh, futures. I mean, uh, I mean, no one wants to change China <laughs> anymore. But also, uh, we should uh, not uh, change. Uh, our models of society and our, our, our economies uh, in uh, certain ways that have been the case uh, recently. So um, 
but of course we, we can have a, a common ground uh, and uh, I think that has to do basically with the concept of the level playing field, which is uh, basically through the WTO or uh, other instruments uh, to create the conditions where, uh, I mean, you can uh, compete uh, independently from the, uh, uh, from the social system where, uh, where you are. Right. So, uh, and for that, we, we need so much dialogue and we need uh, so much, uh, maybe many new instruments in the areas of uh, electronic commerce that uh, Arantxa was mentioning as, as so important. Uh, I mean, uh, everywhere. So uh, that's basically it. Thank you. Uh, François Philippe, between the rock and the hard place is not a very uh, a comfortable uh, place uh, to be, but uh, I think, uh, you have a strategy for maneuvering that thing? Well, I think, uh, uh, first of all, I would say like like the colleagues, I think all of our relationship when it comes to, to China is complex and multidimensional. I, I think it is true, uh, Arantxa said it, it's, it's probably uh, what is on the mind of, of colleagues around the world is how to deal with China. Ernesto said a number of things. Um, I, I like what, um, you know, in, in some sense, there, there are places where we'll have perhaps to compete, and, 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 and we all understand that. There's other areas where um, I'll, I'll go in the same direction and colleagues that we have to cooperate. When you think about global health, climate change, uh, definitely uh, uh, there, there will be space uh, where we need to gather. But Ernesto said something I think which is fundamental for me is that uh, we need to work together as the bold democracies to promote our model of governance, uh, which is freedom, liberty, and democracy. And I think uh, we should not lose sight of that. You know, our model of governance uh, during this pandemic has been challenged by uh, authoritarian states, uh, disinformation. Uh, we've seen a number of things. So we do need to put that squarely on the agenda. And, and to what Arancho was saying, I could not agree more when it comes to fairness. Let's be clear for all of us who listens to us that the rule-based international order and rule-based trade uh, is what has provided stability, uh, predictability, and I would say prosperity uh, for millions of peoples uh, around the world, and certainly since the Second World War, where we established uh, uh, these rules. And I think for us, um, countries like Spain or Brazil or Canada, uh, a rule-based uh, uh, trading system is essential, where people abide by the rules, but also there's reciprocity. And I think that's where uh, going back to what you were saying about uh, the new administration in the U.S., that we can come up together and make sure that we have a system. You say, let's get the WTO back on track to make sure that it works and it, it serves the purpose. And, and it just reminds me, Borge, more generally, uh, we need to make sure that we have institutions which are fit for the 21st century. Uh, many of us uh, have talked about that. How do you retool them, repurpose, refinance uh, to some extent uh, to make sure that they will be there. Now we have a global pandemic, but we can all expect that there will be something else uh, that will be coming. And, and we've seen no challenges too big for humanity, but as you have been fostering at, at Davos and all the colleagues, is that we can do that in my view to cooperation in science. Well, thank you so much. We're coming very close to the end here, but um, uh, Arantxa, uh, global institutions uh, fit for purpose. Uh, are they fit for purpose? And uh, second question, and uh, you will have the chance now uh, to wind up this, is uh, Borrell, uh, the commissioner, uh, vice president, has said that the EU needs to be more assertive uh, in the years to come, uh, also on its foreign and security uh, policy. Uh, do you agree with that? And, and what uh, does it mean in practice? Over to Madrid. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I uh, fully agree with uh, Borel's vision that uh, the EU needs to be more assertive. We call it uh, uh, the EU needs to have a little bit more strategic autonomy, uh, which uh, for a country that is very inserted uh, in the world, uh, that is very globalized, uh, uh, and that is an open economy and open society, does not mean that Europe turns uh, autarkic uh, or it, it turns sovereign. But basically, it, that this concept uh, would mean to me that uh, the EU is capable to respond to the challenges of our time working with uh, allies uh, and countries around the world when this is possible, but it's also ready to work on its own and to lead on its own when working with others is not possible. This is what a strategic autonomy means. Uh, and, uh, and I have to say uh, 
that we've learned uh, during this pandemic, uh, this concept has become a little bit more um, visible to us. Uh, and this is not just on the uh, space of uh, security and defense, uh, but uh, it's also on the area of uh, international value chains where we need uh, to build uh, more resilience. Uh, it's also on the area of technology uh, where uh, we also in Europe uh, need to have uh, a bit more ability to regulate it uh, uh, in accordance with uh, interests, but also in accordance with values that are important uh, in Europe. So a bit more strategic autonomy, but countries around the world should not fear that this means the EU looks inward, but the, the EU becomes uh, a little bit more uh, self-assured and capable of uh, acting uh, when this on its own, when this is the only uh, option that is available. This in a nutshell would uh, Borge be uh, the concept uh, of uh, a strategic autonomy that uh, open strategic autonomy that uh, that has become more um, has become clearer to uh, us in Europe over this last month of uh, pandemic. No, muchas gracias. Thank you so much uh, to Arancha, Obrigada uh, to Ernesto, and uh, thank you, or maybe merci beaucoup to you, uh, François Philippe. Uh, it's been uh, a pleasure to have you.